Well, good morning. Let's all stand up together this morning. Let's go ahead and enter into a time of worship.
the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh yes you are good cause you are sing this next song out together. Great. you 
thank you for the words of that song this morning. We pray that no matter what, Father, that you are the one that we are praising. It's not the things of this world, Father. It's not money. It's not our jobs. But we're praising you, Father. We thank you for that light that you have breathed into us. We thank you for that power that you've given us. Father, your presence is here. And we pray that when Garrett comes up, Father, that you will breathe into him and speak through him, Father God. Breathe fire, Father, into our souls to set us ablaze. Father God, we just thank you for who you are. And as the ushers come forward, Father, you're doing mighty stuff in this church, great stuff. ask you to bless these finances, Father, that they will further your kingdom and not ours. So this morning, we just thank you for all that you're doing. We give you all the praise and all the glory in this place. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to Pit Naz. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. If this is your first time visiting with us, then we just wanna extend a special welcome to you and to let you know how glad we are that you too are part of our Pit Naz family as well this morning. We also wanna ask you to just take a moment and fill out a connection card. When you're done, you can just drop that in one of the offering boxes located on either side of the sanctuary. Also, don't forget to pick up a gift bag. That's our gift to you, our way of saying thank you for being here with us this morning. So please make sure to grab one of those. And if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to stop by the information desk out in the main lobby. There's some people out there who would love to say good morning to you and answer any questions that you might have. We are so excited for our next gathering that's coming up on Sunday, July 29th. It's gonna be right here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. and it is just gonna be a powerful time of worship, prayer, and communion. And then afterwards, we're gonna head out to the gym and we're just gonna hang out and eat some food. So we hope that you've got it on your calendar. We'll see you there. We just wanna make sure that you have our Don't Miss Sunday Fall Edition on your calendar. You are not gonna to wanna to miss it. It's gonna be coming up on Sunday, August 26th. We're gonna have one combined service at 10 a.m., but this year we're gonna be having it at the Bicknell Center. And then afterwards, we are gonna head out to Gorilla Village and we are gonna have a ton of food and games and fun. It is gonna be an awesome time for the whole family. We've got some fun things planned that we have never done before. So you are gonna to wanna to make sure to get it on your calendar and then also be thinking about who you can bring. This is a great opportunity to just invite people to come check out our church and to hang out with us. So once again, it's Sunday, August 26th. We hope to see you there. Hey, we just wanted to remind you that the Pit Naz Rummage Sale is coming up on August 10th and 11th, and we would love for you to come out and help support our teens. And you can do that by simply bringing some stuff to donate to the Rummage Sale or by just coming out and shopping around. Make sure to check your bulletin for more information. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let us know. Hey, we just wanted to remind you that our kids are gonna be heading off to camp this next week. And we just wanted to ask you to be praying for them and the leaders as they head off to camp and throughout the week that God will just do something amazing in their lives. And then also we wanted to let you know that we are so excited that we are only about $7,000 short of hitting our goal for sending all of the kids and teens to camp this year. And so we would just ask that if you have not had an opportunity yet to make your donation, that you would maybe do that today. We're hoping to have that full amount raised by next Sunday, which is when our last group of kids heads off to camp. So please be praying about that. And then if you have any questions, don't hesitate to let us know. 
Well, as we wrap it up this morning, we just want to remind you that for more information on all of these announcements and so much more, please make sure to go out and check out our website throughout the week. We don't want you to miss out on anything. And then also, we would love to connect with you on social media. We have a Facebook page. We're on Instagram. We even have a YouTube channel. So please go out there and find us. We would love to connect with you. And then as we move into today's message, we just want to invite you to go... Welcome home. Glad that you're here this morning. Um, and for those of you who are joining us online, hello. Um, if you don't know, my name is Garrett Stalder. I'm the youth pastor here at Pitt Naz. And um, me and Pastor Thomas are the only pastors here this week. It's kind of nice, but it's cool. Um, for the past couple of weeks, we've been in this series called Messy Family. Um, and Pastor Kyle, or mostly Pastor Adam, and then Age last week talked to us about what God can do with our messy family families. Um, And what's really cool, the serious clarity that we've brought from the very beginning to the very end, is that God can bring hope and healing to even the messiest family through these stories. If you've been here in any of those services, you've understood and recognized that God took broken, messy, messed up, ugly, sometimes even destroyed families and brought hope and healing to them. And if he can do that, then he can do it now, because it's the same God who was then, who is now. Um, And last week, age defined what family meant for us, and that is who we journey with and who we journey like. And just so we can get to know each other a little bit, I've got a few pictures to show you of some of my family members. Some of them are actual bloodline family members, and some of them are not. Um, This is my beautiful bride, Andy, um, one of my family members, right? My own family now. It's kind of cool. Um, this is another part of my family, some of my sisters on Andy's side, my little brother. This is my sister, Robin. There's some of our youth kids. Robin's over there, just embarrass her. Um, there's some of our youth kids, which we could have had a whole camp photo, but I didn't get it in there in time. Um, some of our youth kids who are part of my family. There's my mom and the rest of us kids. There's, my, there's Andy's side, my in-laws, my Andy's side of the family. Um, And there's my dad right there in the middle and my older sister. And if you think my dad and I don't look alike, then there's something wrong with you because we are like the same. Like it was insane yesterday. She was in it. But um, age got to define what family meant last week. And Pastor Adam has been taking us through how God can restore messy families. And this week I get to answer a different sort of question. I get to answer the question, what is it like to be a part of God's family. And I think there's some really cool stuff that we can learn from a chapter in the Bible from the book of John. It's John chapter 11, and we talk about Lazarus. Now, Lazarus is a really cool story. If you've never heard it before, you're going to have to wait till the end of the sermon to hear the end. But if you've heard it before, you know the ending already, so don't spoil it for anyone who's around you. Um, But we're going to talk about what it's like to be a part of God's family through this story in John chapter 11. We're going to start, I'm a dialogue guy through and through. I was in musicals whenever I was in high school. I did one in college. I love dialogue. If I can, if I can zoom in on a dialogue between two people, if they'll allow me to be a part of it, I love debates. I love watching parts of dialogues. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the dialogues between some of the characters in this story, in the story of Lazarus and um, between his sisters and Jesus and all these different things. So if you just bear with me, we'll read small chunks of the scripture. If you've got your Bible, you can turn it, your phone, whatever. I read from the NIV. You can, whatever you've got, you can use. But we're going to go in small chunks, and then we'll talk about the dialogue. We're going to start first, John chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now when he heard this, when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, 
He stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Here's the dialogue. The sisters send word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So from this, we can kind of pick out that Jesus had a prior relationship with the sisters and with Lazarus, a a former friendship, um, what we would call, according to age's definition, part of his family, right? The people who he journeyed with. And the sisters said to Jesus, the one you love is sick. So maybe it's a little bit more. Maybe Jesus has a stronger relationship with Lazarus and the sisters than he would, or with Lazarus than he did with the sisters, right? This is a good friend of Jesus's who is sick. And the fact that Mary and Martha would reach out to Jesus, who's two days away, mind you, would send a message over horseback or over a messenger, whatever it might be, that means that this is a pretty important message. And if it's, import, if it's an important enough message to send to Jesus, that means they believe that Jesus can do something about it. If you know anything else of Jesus, right? if you've never read the Bible before or you're a brand new believer and you know nothing, you should know that Jesus is a healer. He healed people. He restored people. He did miracles all over the place. And they, so they believe that Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead. They will believe that Jesus could heal him. They believe that, that Jesus could do all the things that he had been doing. That's why they sent word. And then Jesus replies to them, or doesn't reply to them, but Jesus replies, the sickness will not end in death. Now, the sisters didn't get this message. They didn't. They had no idea because they were completely blind to this. All they did was send message and then have hope that Jesus might show up. Jesus says to his disciples, the sickness will not end in death. Which is weird that he wouldn't send message back to the sisters to give them some hope. It's weird because then he waited for two days while there's a man who's sick, who he's got a prior relationship with, one of his probably very best friends, according to scholars, it's somebody who he's known really well. One of his very best friends is sick, and the sisters know that Jesus can do something about it. So why would Jesus wait for two days? This was his family, according to the definition that Age gave us last week. Scholars point out that Lazarus and his two sisters, this was the house that Jesus would have slept in the last night that he slept before he went to his crucifixion. These are his family members. The sisters have a point. They, They make a point to point out that this is the one that Jesus loves. The one you love is sick. John, the writer of this book, the writer of this chapter, makes it a point to point out that though Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he waited for two days. I want, I'm, that's, I'm, trying to, I'm repeating this because I want it to hit home. right? Like Jesus has a good relationship with these people, but he waited for two days. And so that's our first point of what it's like to be a part of God's family. Being a part of God's family means submitting to God's timing because even though Jesus was God's son, he still submitted to his father's timing. And that's because Jesus had something greater in store for Mary and Martha and Lazarus and for all of the other people who are involved in this story. And if you hold on, if you've never heard this story before, you'll know what that greater is. And I'm here to tell you today that Jesus has something greater in store for you. God has something greater in store for you if you would just wait on him. If you're you're thinking about doing something on your own because you're tired of waiting, I would caution you, wait on the Lord. Wait on Jesus because he's got something greater in store for you even now if you might wait. And our next section of dialogue is John chapter 11, verses 8 through 16. Jesus says, let us go back to Judea. And they say, but Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they will see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I am going to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. And Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of his disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. 
Here's the dialogue. Thomas says to Jesus, but Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you're going back. That's like me looking at you and saying, why would you go back to the south side of Detroit if the last time you were there, you got shot at? Or like me saying to you, why would you go back to the streets of New York if the last time you were there, you got mugged and almost stabbed? Like, why would you do that? That's what they're saying to Jesus. And Jesus replies, anyone who walks in the daytime won't stumble, for they will see because they see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. Jesus is looking at them and he's saying, look, no threat of death, no fear of pain is going to keep me from being obedient to my father in his timing, and no threat of death, no fear of pain will keep me from helping my family. No matter what. Nothing can keep me from this. There's something else we need to point out. The difference between our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep versus Lazarus is dead. Now Jesus, I'm sure, was hoping that the disciples would just get it, but they didn't. The typical disciples, typical human beings, we don't always get it whenever Jesus talks, and that's okay. So Jesus explains, he says, actually, Lazarus is dead. But the disciples found hope in Lazarus being asleep. They found hope in him being asleep because if you're sleeping, that means your body's working hard. It needs to rest so that way it can get better. Like you go to sleep at night because you've done stuff all day. You've worked all day. So you go to sleep at night so that way your body can recover from what's happened. Hope was found for the disciples in sleep. If Lazarus is asleep, that means his sickness is getting better. That means something is happening so that way Lazarus is actually recovering from what happened. But whenever Jesus told them plainly that Lazarus was dead, all that hope was dashed away. Just as Jesus built them up, he was like, nope, sorry, you guys. He's actually dead. And that's where we find our second point. Being a part of God's family means walking into hopeless situations just as Jesus and his disciples did. Sometimes, as we wait on God, we walk for two days, like like it says in the story, just to walk into a hopeless situation. But every time that we walk into a hopeless situation as family members of Jesus Christ, we get to walk into those situations without fear of what might happen to us. We walk into hopeless situations no matter what what we're thinking about what those people that we're walking in to help might think. No matter what the repercussions might be, no matter what somebody might think of me who's walking in to help someone, it does not matter what they think, what they might say, because we are family members of Christ. And as his brothers and sisters, as God's children, we walk in without fear. And we walk in carrying hope. In that hopeless situation, we bring hope into it. And you know, it might be, whatever your hopeless situation might be, I don't know. It could be a downward spiral in an addiction of some sort. Drugs or pornography or alcohol, whatever it might be. Your hopeless situation could be a divorce that's pending or a divorce that's happened already that you've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed about and it doesn't matter like you can't do you feel like you can't do anything about it but as children of God you get to bring hope into that situation because Jesus brings hope into every situation that he walks into he brings life into every situation that he walks into and the foreshadowing that we heard in the last section of this verse is that this sickness will not end in death. Your sickness, your hopeless situation will not and cannot end in death if you are a family member of Jesus Christ. Wait on his timing and don't be afraid to walk into those hopeless situations, whether it's helping yourself or helping someone else. No fear and carry that hope. The next Passage of scripture is the longest one that we're going to deal with, so you've got to bear, right? Just, just hold on. We're there. Um, it's the longest one we're talking about, but quite possibly has some of the biggest like, meaning. So we start on verse 17. On his arrival, so the disciples and Jesus have walked to where Lazarus and Mary and Martha are. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, so many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the very last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she said this, she went back, called her sister Mary, and said, The teacher is here, and he's asking for you. Now when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Remember, Jesus is still on the outside of the town. Jesus had not yet entered the village, and he was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her. All the people in there who were mourning with her, they followed her because she, they, they thought she was probably going to the tomb to mourn her brother there. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, just like Martha said. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Then Jesus wept. Here's where the dialogue starts. With Martha. And Mary says the same thing. Lord, if you would have just been here, my brother would not have died. I know that you had been healing people. You had been doing all of these things. If you would have just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus replies, your brother will rise again. And Martha and Mary, they're beginning to understand this. They're beginning to understand who Jesus is and what he means. Whenever he's the Messiah, they have this understanding that at the very last day, everyone will be raised to life again. And they will, they will come face to face with God, and they will, they will make an account for all of the things that they have done or not done in their life. They will make an account on the last day. And Mary and Martha believe this, and so did Lazarus. But then we've got this part that comes. And it says that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. And we need to sit in this for a moment. I need you to see this. If you haven't ever seen this part of the story before, I need you to see it. There are perhaps dozens of people mourning over Lazarus' death. Lazarus was a good man, a really good man. Jesus was his, one of his very best friends. Martha and Mary weren't the only two people there crying over their brother's death. There was perhaps a dozen Jews there also weeping because of this man's death. He didn't deserve to die as young as he did. He did not deserve the death that came unto him so early. Why did he have to die? Jesus, if you were only here. Some say Jesus replied in his troubled spirit in anger. He was weeping because he was angry. Some scholars say that. Because he was, he was angry at the faithlessness of the people, like Jesus had been talking about how he could do these things, but they didn't believe. And some scholars say that it was out of sorrow. We can understand, we can deduce from this, that Jesus was crying because there's, I mean, dozens of other people there who are also crying. And in death, it's, it's difficult to not join. I mean, it's hard. Death is hard. But I say it could be both of these things. Jesus is weeping not only out of anger because of the faithlessness of the people, but also because of sorrow. Because Jesus can be both filled with compassion and at a loss for the faithlessness of people at the very same time. Because you see, Jesus is a champion of death. Of course he's angry. He defeats death. He is the resurrection and the life. He's telling them this. He's a champion. He conquered it. But he can still be moved in compassion for the sorrow and the pain of others. And this is the third point. Being a part of God's family means living with a broken heart. Living with a broken heart, not just for your own pain, but for the people who are blind, the people who are lost, the people who are broken, for the people who are represented by the empty seats who are in this place, the people who you didn't quite reach out to because you were feeling a little bit awkward, about inviting them to church, those lost, those broken, those blind people who don't know the hope and the healing of Jesus Christ, the people who don't know what God can do for them, those are the people who we can live with a broken heart for because we are family members of Jesus Christ, because we are family members of God. We also live with a broken heart for those who mourn. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And you know what? Maybe whenever we pray for them, the Holy Spirit will go, and the Holy Spirit will be them and bring them peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding is what it says in Scripture. But maybe the Holy Spirit isn't just the one who's supposed to go and comfort that person. Maybe you are. Because God didn't put you on this earth to be just for yourself. God didn't put you on this earth just to say a prayer for someone and let let everything else just kind of fall into place. Jesus put you on this earth, or God put you on this earth for a purpose. And maybe that purpose, in your pain, in your frustration, in your anger, and all of the hurt that you felt because of the lost one that you that you the loved one that you lost too early, the friend that you lost who didn't deserve to die, maybe that pain, whatever it might be, your past, maybe that pain is for the benefit of another person. Maybe God broke your heart on purpose so you could go and bless someone else and use your story as a platform to share with them the hope in Christ. The last bit of our dialogue, John chapter 11, starts with verse 36. Jesus, or sorry, Yes, verse 36. The Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have saved this man's life? And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, Jesus says. But Lord, said Martha, the sister sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you you would always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here so that they may believe that you have sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. But Lord, said Martha, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been in there for four days. Scholars say that the spirit hangs around a dead body. This is what they believe or believed, is that the spirit hung around a body, a person, for three days. No more than three days is what they believed. And so on the fourth day, or after the night of the third day, they believed that there was absolutely no way that this person could be saved. They believed a lot lot of the Jews and the people, or the, the devout religious people, believed that resurrection could happen. And I believe that a lot of us maybe believe that resurrection could happen, but we're afraid to believe that it might actually happen in our case. And so in this situation, in this story, we find hopelessness. Not only did Lazarus die and Jesus waited two days to do anything about it, not only are Mary and Martha and all those Jews weeping and hopelessly just sobbing, now, the third day, that threshold has been passed. There's no way the Spirit could enter back into this body. There's no way that resurrection could happen. There's no way. The hope is completely gone. Crushed. Mary and Martha, crushed. I can only imagine. And Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And at the end of the story, what do we find? Even though Mary and Martha, and probably a lot of the Jews who were there, didn't believe that Lazarus could be raised from the dead, he was still raised from the dead, was stripped of his grave clothes and let go. This is our fourth point. Being a part of the family of God means rising from the dead. I don't know what that means for you. But if you've been sleeping, wake up. This is the only thing I want you to hear. You can fall asleep after I'm done. This is why Christ died. It wasn't just to extend your lifespan into eternity. It wasn't just to give you something to look forward to after this life is over. Jesus died and was resurrected to free us from the death and the pain that is sin and selfishness from fear and doubt and addiction right here in this life right now. 
That's why Jesus died. If you believe for a second that the only reason that Jesus Christ came and went was to give you eternal life, I am so glad to be able to tell you today that you are wrong. Because God gave you, it says in Ephesians chapter one that God gave you a purpose before the creation of the world to live a holy life. To get away from the fear, to get away from the slavery that is temptation and sin, to get away from all of that stuff that we've dealt with over our lives. To look at painful situations and to walk into those situations with hope. Knowing that Jesus Christ can literally raise people from the dead. You know that same power that was with Christ in that moment? It says in scripture that that same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. What does that mean? That means that Jesus wants you to wear resurrection on your sleeve. He wants you to put it on like a helmet. He wants you to take it around everywhere that you go and tell people about it. Because that is where you find hope. Good luck finding hope in anything else. Because the things of this world, they'll fail you. Your wife, your husband, they'll fail you. If you're struggling with an addiction to pornography, it's going to fail you, I promise. And if it doesn't fail you, you're going to end up doing a lot worse things than just looking at pornography. If you're struggling with alcohol addiction, okay, I understand it. My mom died last year because of her addiction to alcohol. I get it, but I know, I know what's coming. I watched it happen. If you're struggling and you're in pain, I'm telling you that there is hope of resurrection for you. And as children of God, as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, we get to walk around resurrected. As if we had already died with Lazarus and were raised to dead because of what Christ did on the cross for us. It says in Romans chapter 8 verse 15, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful, slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. We were lost. We were orphans on this earth. We were completely without any hope without Christ. And if you don't know Jesus today, this is how you are. I'm sorry. You're lost. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ, God wants to adopt you as his own children. This spirit of adoption that enters into you after you accept Christ, you get to look at God, the, crea the one who breathed galaxies into existence, the one who spun planets and made them happen, the one who knit you together in your mother's womb, who gave you a purpose before he created this earth. You get to look at him and you get to say, Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic term for dad. I don't know what it's like to be a dad, but I know there's some dads in here. What is it like to have your little boy or your little girl look up at you and say, Daddy? If you've never had that, holy cow, man, you can have it. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. If you have ever sinned in your life, I'm sorry, you deserve death. But Christ died in your place. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Live a resurrected life on this side of eternity. Because this life isn't for throwing away and waiting until the next life comes. It's not. This life is for living resurrected right now, for taking the hope of Jesus Christ right now and giving it to other people. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. If you want to be cleansed from unrighteousness, I beg of you, confess your sins to your best friend, to your wife, to your husband, to whoever. He only asks us for a confession. He has to cleanse us from unrighteousness. I say it's a pretty unfair trade, but he's willing to do it. All you have to do is confess. So here's the big idea. Being a part of God's family means being set free to live who the Father created you to be. Now, if he, if he had a purpose for you before he created the earth, and the earth sits so however far from the sun to make sure that everyone here can have oxygen underneath the atmosphere that we live under, 
If he put the earth in a, the most perfect place that trees might grow and that grass might grow and that flowers might bloom in the spring and that they all might die and go away in the winter, if Jesus, if God made it so important to him to make the smallest of bug and bacteria but also the largest of large mountain that's ever been, if, if God had that much, has that much purpose for those things, and he created you and knew you before he did those things. How much more purpose do you have? You, every single one of you in here, look, I'm... Be resurrected from the day, from, from t- be resurrected from this life, die and raise again with Jesus, not because of my fancy words, not because of anything that I've said, Die to yourself and be resurrected because you've got a father, whether you've got one here on earth or not, you've got a father who cares so much about you that he would be tortured and beaten and torn apart by this world to save us from ourselves and to save us from the power of sin and death. Being a part of God's family means being set free to live who the Father created you to be. You can stand up as we sing this last song.
You know, it's part of the American culture to not let anyone know that you that there's something wrong. That's how that's how we live in this great country. That's how we live, typically. If there's something wrong, maybe it's time for you to let someone in. And you know what? Maybe you don't want to let them know exactly what's going on. Maybe you just need, maybe somebody just needs to know that something's wrong. Now we don't have, we don't have time for an altar call, but you want to know one of the best ways that you could probably let, let someone know that something's wrong by stepping out and saying it. How is anybody going to know that something's wrong if you don't say it? Some people have good discernment, some people don't. But look, it's time for you to confess your sins. It's time for you to get right with God. He already did all the work. Come on, let's go. Like, do, come on. It's time. It's time for this, for this generation of people, young and old, all the people who are alive right now, it's time for us to do something greater, okay? And the greatest thing that you can do, I believe, with my whole heart, is giving your life to Jesus because he's the only one with the power to raise dead people to life. So if you need to confess something to someone, whether you say it to the person on your right or your left or before, as everyone's walking out, if you need to come down here, just to let them know, don't share it with anybody if you don't want to, but just to let people know that there's something wrong. Confess it to God because he's the faithful and just one. He's the one who can cleanse you from unrighteousness. It's time. Right now is the time. Don't wait. The longer you wait, the more your heart's gonna get hard. The harder your heart gets, the less of a chance you're gonna have later to do something about it. It's time right now. It's time right now. Let's pray. God, thank you for another opportunity to get right with you. Because chance after chance after chance, no matter how hard we try, we can't do anything. But you've already done all the hard work. You've already called us children even before we've accepted But how much more is it to accept you? How much more can we receive if we just say yes? God, give us the strength and the courage to step out, whether it's at an altar or to a best friend, to a family member, whether it's to someone we barely know, like a pastor, somebody who you know who who loves God. God, I I don't know who it might be. But Father, I pray that you'd give each and every one of these people strength and courage and wisdom and knowledge to go forward and do something. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. One last thing. Don't forget that this stage isn't Christianity. You are Christians. This stage, like coming to Sunday and getting your fix isn't Christianity. Christianity is leaving this place and going and telling others about what the good news is, living in power and righteousness and love, okay? So take something from this, whether it was a song, a smile from across the room, doesn't matter. Take it and give it to somebody else. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Look at Sunday.